Il y a donc un problème législatif. Quel cadre mettre en place au niveau national pour répondre au respect des droits de ces enfants dans cette situation particulière et de faire en sorte qu'ils ne soient pas affectés par une situation qui entraîne, dans la plupart des cas, précarité, insécurité, rejet, honte et qui restreint leurs droits d'enfants. Mais il y a un problème humain, celui de la dignité de l'enfant, qui est amputé d'une partie de la reconnaissance de son statut et de ses besoins particuliers d'enfant en développement, surtout son droit à recevoir affection, éducation et protection de la part de ses parents, et qui en est privé par une décision d'autorité, car très souvent, l'incarcération d'un parent signifie aussi l'éclatement de la famille. La Convention, me semble-t-il, est basée sur l'idée du caractère primordial de la relation parent-enfant. Cette relation, c'est l'origine et l'histoire de l'enfant. C'est aussi la garantie de son futur. Comment faire alors pour que ces enfants puissent continuer à disposer des soins éducatifs dont ils ont besoin Comment préserver la relation avec le parent incarcéré Comment stimuler la résilience de l'enfant Enfin, au-delà du caractère législatif et de la souffrance humaine, se pose la question des politiques pénales et pénitentiaires des États. Ne doit-on pas, lorsqu'une décision de justice est prise vis-à-vis d'un parent, se poser la question de son impact sur le ou les enfants et penser alors non seulement et exclusivement en termes de sécurité publique, que je comprends, mais également à celle de l'intérêt supérieur de l'enfant. Et lorsqu'un parent est détenu, ne peut-on pas imaginer l'exécution de cette peine différemment lorsque le sort des enfants est en jeu Enfin, le recours à la privation de liberté est-il toujours indispensable Je pense que c'est de ces questions qu'il sera l'objet aujourd'hui et je me réjouis évidemment de vous entendre et d'entendre les débats. Je souhaite à tous une très fructueuse journée. Je passe immédiatement à, au premier exposé introductif, les services de prison professionnelle, et j'ai le plaisir de donner la parole à M. Abdullah Kocho, qui est manager des programmes nationaux de justice juvénile au Pakistan, qui a travaillé longtemps dans les questions de protection des enfants dont les mères sont emprisonnées, qui a lui-même personnellement conduit de nombreuses visites de monitoring dans les prisons de son pays et qui a également été très actif dans l'aide juridique apportée à ces femmes. Monsieur Cochot, vous avez la parole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Honorable Chair of the CRC Distinguished Experts, Professionals, and Ladies and Gentlemen. The problems and issues that I want to discuss with this August Forum are found around the world, but my reference point will be Pakistan. And these problems and issues as are also found in many other countries. The Honorable Chair, in many countries, the rights of babies and children living with women prisoners and mothers in prisons are not made. From the time of arrest till the release of women prisoners accompanying children's best interests are not taken into consideration policies and laws do not consider them. Respected Chair, there is a little scientific and systematic research on the social and psychological impacts of the treatment given and the procedure applied to children accompanying women prisoners in detention centers. Nor are there any systems to record these children's vulnerability inside detention centers. 
for example, except for issues of diet, pregnancy, and suspension of death sentences for pregnant women mentioned in the Pakistan prison rules, there's a no direct legislative provision for children with women prisoners in Pakistan. Article 4 of the Constitution of Pakistan 1973, it states that all individuals will be dealt with in accordance with law and will not be deprived of their body, interests, liberty, and life. But these children, unfortunately, are deprived of these fundamental rights. They are deprived of their liberty and on the other fundamental protections. Honorable Chair, the maximum age for children living in prison varies widely between states. In Pakistan, the children can officially stay from infancy to six years, but it is reported and has been observed that there are some children who stay up to 10 years. Cases in which women have killed their husband. Charter forms an important backdrop to certain constitutional court cases in the South African Constitutional Court that I want to bring to the committee's attention. The South African Constitutional Court has, in recent years, dealt with two cases relating to the best interests of children whose parents are facing imprisonment. The first was called S versus M, with the Centre for Child Law as Amicus Curiae, and the second, MS versus S, with the Centre for Child Law as Amicus Curiae. The two cases have very similar names, but they are, in fact, about two different mothers that happen to have similar initials. Um, the first of these cases, S versus M, was really an absolutely groundbreaking case in South Africa. The facts were a woman who had been convicted of a series of frauds was facing imprisonment. Actually, only a short period of imprisonment because the, the planned sentence was that she would spend about six months in prison and that would then be released under correctional supervision, which is a form of house arrest. Um, nevertheless, if she went to prison for those six months, it would mean um, quite catastrophic event for the family because she would not be able to pay the, the housing payments, they would lose their home, uh, the children would have to be cared for elsewhere and so on. She was the primary caregiver of three boys ranging in age from 15 down to 9. She had not been married to either of the two fathers, the, the, two, uh, the eldest boy had a different father from the two younger ones, and she lived separately from them. The court invited Amicus Curiae, which is a friend of the court, to address the following question in written and oral arguments. This is what the Constitutional Court asked. What are the duties of a sentencing court to consider the best interests of the child when considering imprisonment of a primary caregiver? And you can see there also that the court made a special effort to be gender neutral in the way that they posed the question, because they didn't refer specifically to mothers, but to primary caregivers. The Constitutional Court handed down a judgment which carefully considered the best interests of the child and how the concept should be weighed when there are competing rights. Because obviously here there was the right of the best interests of the child and not to be separated from the family on the one side, but on the other side, the community's right to be safe from crime. The majority of the court avoided the narrow thinking of offenders with children must not be allowed to get off lightly. That's something that will often be said by the public. Um, <clears throat> why should prisoners or offenders who have children get off lightly? But the Constitutional Court said, no, that is not the question. We must focus on the rights of the child, not the adult. And the, the, the court said that the best interest principle was of paramount consideration as it is under South African Constitution. The judge who delivered the, the judgment, the majority judgment, was Justice Sachs. And this is a, a very uh, nice quotation uh, from the judgment. He says, <clears throat> every child has his or her own dignity. If a child is to be constitutionally imagined as an individual with a distinctive personality, and not merely a miniature adult waiting to reach full size, he or she cannot be treated as a mere extension of his or her parents, umbilically destined to sink or swim with them. 
The unusually comprehensive and emancipatory character of Section 28, that is the section in the South African Constitution dealing with children's rights, presupposes that in our new dispensation, the sins and traumas of fathers and mothers should not be visited on their children. The, ju the judgment also stressed the importance of restorative justice and Mrs. M was sentenced to a period of correctional supervision without going to prison first, in other words, entirely uh, served in the community. The sentence included that she must undergo community service and she had to pay back the money that uh, her victims had lost through her fraud. The court noted that this type of sentence was more restorative and helped to balance the rights of the offender, her children, the victims and the community. So the S versus M judgment set a precedent which requires all South African courts to give specific consideration of the impact on the best interests of the child when sentencing a primary caregiver. If the possible imprisonment will be detrimental to the child, then the scales must tip in favor of a non-custodial sentence, unless the case is so serious that it would be entirely inappropriate for the offender not to go to prison. Even then, there must be measures to protect the child. In cases where it's not possible to find an alternative to prison, then the court must be satisfied that the children's needs will be met and that measures are in place to do so. And in both S versus M and in the other case, MS versus the state, the Constitutional Court appointed a curator ad litem for the children who investigated their circumstances and reported back to the court so that the court could have a full picture of what the impact would be on the children. The good news since S versus M is that the precedent has been applied in many South African cases. Uh, it is in fact the most cited judgment that the Centre for Child Law has been involved with. It has been applied as well in bail proceedings, so therefore not only in the sentencing process but also in the um, pre-trial phase. And it has often, although not always, resulted in a non-custodial sentence. The not so good news since S versus M um, is that although the Constitutional Court used a gender neutral term and did not restrict primary caregiver to single primary caregiver, um, another case has subsequently come before the Constitutional Court that has narrowed that uh, approach. In 2010, uh, Mrs. M. S., also facing a short term of imprisonment for fraud, approached the Constitutional Court. The court below had said that she, S versus M did not apply to her because she was married and she still lived with her husband. Her argument was that she was the main caregiver and that the children would still have, um, it would be a huge impact on their lives if she went to prison. The Centre for Child Law again entered as amicus curiae, friend of the court, and argued to keep the precedent broad and that primary caregivers who were not sole caregivers but main caregivers should also be covered by the precedent set in S versus M. Regrettably, the Constitutional Court, whilst reiterating what they had said in S versus M, held that it applies only to single primary caregivers and that the father in the household could look after the children. There was only one dissenting judgment, although it is much longer than the majority judgment um, in this case. So obviously one of the judges felt that it would have been better to keep it broad. To conclude, the avoidance of remand detention and sentences of imprisonment for primary caregivers or main caregivers is a preventive strategy that more countries should be encouraged to use. The best interests of the child should be a central consideration at all stages of the system. I thank you. Merci beaucoup, Anne, de cette présentation. Merci aussi de nous avoir fait état de cette jurisprudence extrêmement Intéressante, celle de 2008, évidemment, euh, la restriction de 2010 est un petit peu plus difficile à supporter. <coughs> J'aurais plaisir à faire la connaissance du juge Saxe. Malheureusement, il n'est pas dans la salle, parce que je pense qu'il a ouvert une voie extrêmement intéressante avec euh, l'application élargie du principe de l'intérêt supérieur de l'enfant. Alors, après l'aspect pénitentiel, l'aspect légal, voici l'aspect des relations, l'aspect la, du facteur 
relationnel et j'ai le plaisir d'accueillir Madame Isabelle Bordin, qui est une psychiatre spécialisée dans les soins pour les enfants et les adolescents, qui travaille dans un, une section, une division de psychiatrie sociale de l'Université de Sao Paulo. Merci beaucoup, chère madame, et je vous cède le micro. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, today, I'm going to talk about three topics, three interrelated topics. Young children raised in prison, negative and positive aspects, mental health of the incarcerated population of two Brazilian large cities, and risk factors for child mental health problems. Children living with incarcerated mothers. According to Brazilian laws, incarceration units for women must have nursery rooms where they can breastfeed their babies up to six months of age. This was a law from 1984. Incarceration units may also have, uh, should have, special sections for pregnant women with conditions for delivery. This is a law from 2009. And units for women must have also daycare for children aged six months to six years. In Brazil, children aged seven to 14 must go to school, and this is mandatory. Daycares are required to have qualified staff and adequate operating hours to guarantee high quality care to children and incarcerated mothers or caretakers. Regarding marital stability and child care, in Brazil, the majority of men in prison are supported by their partners who visit them and take care of their children. However, the majority of incarcerated women are abandoned by their partners and close relatives. Children living with their mothers or caretakers in prison must live when completing seven years of age and are frequently sent to shelters or relatives that live far away from the prison, losing contact with the mother. Also, older children of incarcerated mothers suffer prejudice in school and may drop out. Young children raised in prison, there are negative and positive aspects related to that. Negative aspects include pregnancy developing in a context of vulnerability and lack of social support, maternity in seclusion, favoring maternal depression and drug use, and prison being an adverse environment for raising children due to penitentiary rules, for example, restricted hours of sun exposure, and frequent interpersonal conflicts involving the mother. Positive aspects include mother-child relationship, is not broken, reducing the possibility of sending the baby to shelters and later abandonment. Babies are not early deprived from their mother's affection. And women benefit from the experience of caring for their babies, decreases distress related to incarceration, and have a positive effect on maternal mental health. Brazilian women in prison, the number of them uh, are, uh, is increasing in Brazil, mainly due to involvement in drug trafficking. Now, female units are overcrowding, which represent more difficulties to offer an appropriate environment for children living in prisons. Difficulties involve physical space, trained staff, and high costs. A study conducted at the Federal University of Sao Paulo with incarcerated adults from two cities, two large cities, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. 
the study sample was 1,840 incarcerated adults. So the first point we note is the number of men much greater than the number of women, 7% women, 93% men. However, 80% of women had children or adolescents, compared to 40% among men. And regarding the mental health problems of incarcerated men and women, more women than men had mental health problems, 45% women, 21% men. And considering current severe mental health problems, which include psychotic episodes, bipolar disorder, and severe depression, 26% of women were affected compared to 10% of men. Another study conducted in the general population, population with a population-based sample of children and adolescents, uh, examined risk factors for child mental health problems. The study had two main objectives, to determine the prevalence of specific types of child mental health problems in an urban poor neighborhood. These problems could be internalizing problems, which means anxiety depression, or externalizing problems, delinquent behavior, uh, defined as aggressive behavior and or rule breaking behavior. And the study also identified risk factors, paying attention specifically to important for the children of incarcerated parents, maternal anxiety, depression, and absent father. The study was conducted in an urban poor neighborhood of a city with 230,000 inhabitants. This city was very near uh, Sao Paulo city. Um, I'm having problems here. One back, one, one slide back, please. Yes. Uh, Sao Paulo is a, a big city with uh, 220 million people living in the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo. And this neighborhood we conduct this study was an urban poor neighborhood, probably similar to many other places around the world and near uh, highly densely populated cities. The study examined 480 children aged 6 to 17 years and we found that 37% of the sample had emotional or behavioral problems. 19% of the sample had internalizing problems only, meaning anxiety, depression, and 7% of the sample had externalizing problems only, meaning delinquent behavior. And 11% of the sample had both types of problems. <coughs> Here I'm going to represent the main study outcomes. In blue, internalizing problems only. In red, externalizing problems only. And in green, both problems. And here, the most relevant risk factors we found in this study. Child factors, being female instead of a male. Being an adolescent instead of a child suffering severe punishment by parents, defined by different behaviors, mainly hitting the child with an object. Mother factors were important, mainly maternal anxiety, depression, and a working mother, a working mother outside of the home and the children being unattended. And for the father factors, it was important to consider the absence of a father, mainly among adolescents. So the four important risk factors for anxiety depression in the child were being female, being an adolescent, having a mother with, maternal, uh, with anxiety depression, 
and having a working mother so that adolescent girl will stay home without um, maternal support. For the delinquent behavior in the child, it was very important the absence of the father for adolescents, the presence of anxiety depression in the mother, and being severely punished by the parents. And for the group of children with both problems, the risk factors were being female, suffering severe punished by parents, and having a mother with anxiety depression. Now the complete picture, we can see the maternal anxiety depression as a very important risk factor for the three types of problems in children. And also the absence of a father, a specific risk factor for delinquent behavior in their children. To conclude, Living in prison with the mother may be beneficial to young children depending on maternal mental health and environmental conditions. Anxiety and depression are frequent among incarcerated women, many of them mothers. Maternal anxiety depression is a very important risk factor for different types of child emotional behavioral problems and the absence of a father favors aggressive behavior and rule-breaking behavior among adolescents that live in urban poor areas. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame Bourdin, de cet euh, éclairage. Je crois que nous pouvons féliciter nos trois experts pour euh, le rapport qui se complète bien. Maintenant, j'ai le grand plaisir d'ouvrir une petite et courte partie, malheureusement, mais qui est euh, consacrée à des témoignages de jeunes gens qui ont vécu ou qui vivent des situations telles que celles que nous avons décrites. Ces deux jeunes gens se sont encadrés euh, dans un programme qui s'appelle le programme, le projet Coping qui est un projet du département de travail social de l'université de Huntersfield au Royaume-Uni. Et nous aurons le plaisir d'avoir une jeune fille et un jeune homme. Nous allons d'abord commencer par Sian Emily Knott, qui est une jeune fille de 13 ans, qui nous fait le grand plaisir. Et je la félicite de son courage de venir nous trouver et dont la mère est d'ailleurs dans la salle, et à qui je vais donner la parole sans tarder. Sian, vous avez le micro. Thank you. My name is Sian and I live in the northwest of England. I am 13 years old and in year 9 of high school. I am here on behalf of the Coping Project, which is looking into how having a parent in prison affects children and young people. Hi, my name is Rahil and I live in Manchester, England. I am 17 years old and currently studying at college. We are here to inspire a change in the prison system using our experiences from using our experiences as well as experiences from other children. Today we'll be talking about some of the issues faced when a parent is sent to prison. Although the dialogue may be a personal account of our experiences, research has found that it is representative of many young people. Arrest. I was with my dad when he was arrested. I spent most of my time with him as we were very close. It was sudden and very unexpected. From his arrest and my first visit was about two months and I found this heartbreaking. 
immediately after my dad was arrested, he was released on bail for two years. This period, this period of time was extremely nerve-wracking, as I thought he could be taken away any time. But it was not until he was found guilty by the jury that I felt the effect of him not being around. Sentence My dad was sentenced in 2010 to seven years in prison. Due to the rules in the UK, my dad will serve three and a half years. My dad was sentenced in 2006 to 19 years in prison. He will actually serve nine and a half years. He has been in prison for five years now. This is his fifth prison, each with different rules we both have to adapt to. Prison. When my dad was first sentenced, I had thoughts of what prison was like. The idea of a ball and chain came to mind when I imagined how my dad must be feeling. Prison reality. When to my surprise, this is actually what it looks like in the UK. Visits, the seven wise. These are some of the thoughts other young people have about their visits. Why don't the prison staff treat us like human beings? Why can we not have private visits? It's difficult to talk when there are others about. Why can we not have a support group set up for children who are going through the same thing? All I want is a friend. Why is there no help? My mother cannot work and we have no money. Why was there nobody I could talk to when my dad was taken away? Why can prison staff not speak to families at the beginning and get to know them? Why can I only see my dad once a month? I worry that he will forget me. Small changes, big impact. Recently, the prison where my dad is has incorporated some sofas. This has made the visit feel more comfortable and homely. It has also allowed some for more physical contact, which is normally quite restricted. Release. I can't wait till my dad is released. I will take him on holiday. When my dad went to prison, I was only eight years old. When he is released, I will be 18 years old and he, he can buy me a car. The Three Eye Survival Guide. Isolation. Don't feel left out. Many people are in the exact same position as you. Get help and offer help. Information. There are numerous places you can gain vital information which will help you cope. Inspiration. Inspire a change in the system. Let your voice be heard, perhaps through an NGO. Such as ones like these. These are some of the NGOs that are available in the United Kingdom. Thank you for listening. If you have any further questions, please come and speak to us during the day. Merci beaucoup à ces deux jeunes. Vous avez vu qu'ils se sont présentés eux-mêmes beaucoup mieux que je l'aurais fait moi-même. Et merci de ce témoignage extrêmement bien 
présenté et qui nous fait toucher du doigt la réalité et qui, une fois de plus, illustre les capacités, les compétences et la nécessité de dialoguer directement avec les enfants. Je vous suis très reconnaissant d'avoir été parmi nous. La première partie de cette journée s'achève maintenant, commence maintenant la deuxième partie qui est réservée au groupe de travail. Donc je rappelle qu'il y a deux groupes de travail. Vous avez eu la distribution des de, listes des groupes, vous savez où vous devez aller. Le premier reste ici, le groupe qui s'occupe des, des petits-enfants et enfants qui vivent ou qui rendent visite à leurs parents en prison, ici. Le deuxième groupe se rend dans la salle numéro 11. Ce sont les enfants dont les parents sont incarcérés, mais qui vivent dans un autre environnement que la prison. Donc la salle 11. Pour aller à la salle 11, vous, avez, vous aurez à l'extérieur deux personnes du secrétariat qui vont vous guider à la salle 11. Les gens qui se trouvent dans la salle 11 restent à la salle 11 et reviennent ici pour la séance plénière à 17h20. Donc à 17h20, heure suisse, les... la séance plénière reprend ici. Donc euh, chacun connaît sa destination. Je vous souhaite à tous une bonne journée. Je vous rappelle encore qu'il y a l'exposition qui est au bas, euh, le serpent en dessous, que vous pouvez visiter notamment avec des visites guidées à l'heure de la pause déjeuner. Merci à tous, bon travail, bonne journée. living inside the prison but children living outside the prison with incarcerated parents. Um, earlier this morning Anne Skelton's uh, presentation uh, of the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of Children and, and how it, it devotes a specific clause to the uh, to children in, uh, detained in prison uh, is uh, gives us some idea of how the African Charter is a little bit more progressive uh, th than our CRC was. But I have to remind you that uh, we do have a, a little mention of uh, children who are detained or imprisoned in our Article Number 9, Paragraph 4. We do not go into detail, but we do have uh, many related articles that the Convention uh, deals part bits and pieces uh, with in terms of children in this 
situation. And uh, the, uh, high co the constitutional uh, court's decision from uh, uh, South Africa was uh, very informing. And I think recently the Suva High Court in Fiji has also sentenced a uh, non-custodial sentence for a uh, mother who, who with children or with a baby. Uh, I don't need to remind our participants today that uh, this is not an opportunity for uh, lengthy statements or introduction about the NGO that or the work that you're involved with, but we would really like to discuss on uh, some of the issues evolve, uh, around the children with incarcerated parents. We would like to, uh, at the end of the day, we would like to uh, identify uh, some examples of uh, good policies and practices and some principles. I think some of this was already introduced, the legislative uh, framework. Uh, and then another uh, key uh, result of this day of general discussion would be how to disseminate this to the state, to the states, the UN agency, and local NGOs and national NGOs. Uh, we have to remember that children who are incarcerated, who ha are, uh, uh, who have incarcerated parents, are entitled to the same rights as other children, and they they are not that they are not offenders themselves, and the. Uh, the sentence or the crimes that their parents have committed should not be uh, applied to the, the child or children themselves. Um, we will start off with a, a short uh, presentation who will, by our facilitator, uh, Mr. Yao Yakbetsi from the International Catholic Child Bureau. Uh, excuse me, incidentally, our rapporteur is Ms. Uh, Hadil uh, Alasmar, and she will be serving as the rapporteur uh, for the day. Uh, before I give Mr. Yao the floor, uh, if you as participants would like to uh, make your points or uh, raise some issues or questions, please, I think it would be best if you uh, put up your uh, your uh, what do you call it the flag so that the secretariat will be able to see who it is and will keep a list of persons on the uh, list and I will try to give everyone a chance to speak but a uh, maximum of two minutes and I'm afraid I have to I will be very uh, firm on this maximum of two minutes. Uh, uh, with no further ado, Mr. Yakbetsi, uh, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, je, je voudrais, dans, dans ces propos liminaires, donner quelques indications visant à encadrer nos discussions. Il s'agit, pour ce groupe de travail numéro un, de travailler sur les bébés et enfants vivant avec et visitant leurs parents en détention. Donc il s'agit d'une discussion sur les droits de l'enfant qui doit se focaliser sur les droits de l'enfant. Même s'il est vrai qu'il y a des enfants dont les parents sont dans des situations similaires comme celle des détentions dans le contexte de l'immigration, nous souhaitons que les présentes discussions se consacrent, se concentrent sur les enfants dont les parents whose parents have uh, committed acts which have then fallen under criminal uh, criminal sentence. The aim of this discussion is to move forward on this issue. We encourage all of you, therefore, to focus on positive examples. We want to analyze and see how the rights and the needs of the children whose parents are incarcerated are respected and taken into consideration. This general debate is not going to, uh, is only going to look at the criminal justice system. We also encourage good practices and recommendations. Please do stick to the subject and we are I'm uh, going to try to speak as briefly and concisely as possible so that everybody has the opportunity to uh, take part. We will therefore allow each of you one minute forty. 
we will achieve convincing results if we try to understand this as a, a group effort to cover as many points as possible. It's not a matter of organizations giving individual experiences and, and stories. If you think that you, if you wanted to talk about an issue which is touched upon by another speaker, please do not repeat the same issue. Then the subject will be featured in the report by the rapporteur. Also, it's not a matter of whether you agree or not with an idea here. We're not trying to measure the extent of support for a particular project, but rather we want to look at how children are affected and try to identify the resources that we can use to preserve their rights. The subjects that we want to look at here are the legal, related to legal regula uh, regulations, political issues, policies, lim age limits, visits to facilities, what role the civil society can play, so social services, sharing best practices, statistics, and reintegration. First of all, with regard to legal framework, we want to know whether there are regions that have a legal for a specific legal, legal framework. Perhaps you might think that the issue is not sexy enough to uh, merit a legal framework, but is it not necessary to give a legal status to the child who's living with or visiting their parent in prison in order to avoid the situation that exists in many parts of the world where the child has no protection? If a legal framework is necessary, what needs do we need to consider? Perhaps age, social services and prisons, safety, health. What is your experience of the situation? We can ask ourselves if a restorative or reparatory justice system could be applied to the parent who has committed a crime in order to spare the child the painful experience of living within a prison. As for the political phase, the conditions of arrest of a mother, should they respect different criteria to, if there's a, if the child has, ch if the woman has children because of her, because of her child, we were able to see that the presence of a child does not seem to constitute a, an exception, uh, bear, for bearing in mind the fragility of the child. What conditions? of arrest um, exist. As for uh, the criminal criminal investigation department, do they know that the the, the parent that, that the person they've arrested is a parent? Should they not provide support measures for the children so that they can visit their parent in prison? Could we envisage restorative uh, measures instead? What experiences do you have in your country? With regard to the age limit, how old can a child be when visiting a parent in prison? 18 months old, three years old, six years or 10 years? What are the criteria that determine the age limit? Are there facilities within the prison for children, and should the law bear in mind the psychological effects of this issue? It's important to think of the greater interest of the child in all of these issues and to ask ourselves, is it important for there to be an age limit? With regards to visits, should should parents be detained for longer than the age limit for the children? With regard to visits, therefore, is there a, a time limit for this visit? And is it does it uh, come up against obstacles? Is there an area for children to play in? Is there a support area provided for children visiting their parents in prison? Some people think that 
children visiting their parents is not that appropriate because it's traumatizing and can lead to shock, to heartbreak for the child whenever they have to leave their parent behind and sometimes even once they get back home. The implementation of of suitable services in the prison, could, could it be an appropriate initiative to take? What, what is your experience in, in this field? Using new technology to maintain the link between the incarcerated parents and the child is a good idea. But there are people who say that we need to be careful. What is your experience? Technology, perhaps, is technology appropriate to uh, provide a quality visit? And with regard to facilities for providing structure and support to children visiting their parents in prison, there's an agreement that the fact that the that early childhood is a key moment in building the personality of a human being, that the moving a child into a closed environment is it not going to mark his personality for good uh, if a minimum number of conditions are not provided to ensure that they can survive the consequences of this visit to prison without consequences. Children living with or visiting their parents in prison, should they not be should they be deprived of uh, enjoying the right to good food, to the right to leisure and uh, education? Should these services not organize some kind of structure and support in order to help the child um, reintegrate into society once the pr prison sentence of their mother is finished? With regards to the intervention of civil society, the situation of children living with or visiting the parent in prison is a real reality which um, can be ignored by states. A civil society needs to um, combat for the protection of the child We could ask ourselves about several aspects of this intervention. Is it just out of generosity? Should there be a six-month project, a year, yearly project, or something like that? Are they just humanitarian interventions, or are they aimed at protecting the rights of the child? Does civil society um, talk about the issue, carry out advocacy and awareness raising and, and mobilize authorities so that they take on the responsibilities. With regards to social services, education is key for all children, no matter where they are, despite and despite having a parent in prison. Prisons, do they do prisons provide the correct facilities for education and creches, for example? Is there specific education provided for the types of imprisonment? What about health care and psychological support uh, for good nutrition given uh, aimed at um, supporting the child? What good practices can be upheld by states with relation to social services? Should detention centres and prisons not provide child-friendly environments with play areas and places to help them overcome the traumatism. What is your experience in your countries? With regard to exchange of good practices, we need to capitalize in order to carry out advocacy. Civil, civil society has, has, has it carried out research on the phenomenon on a national, regional, and international level. Many NGOs have developed expertise and have really in-depth experience. Have these experiences been capitalized on? And have there been exchanges of good practices amongst NGOs in the same country or, or within the region? And have these exchanges taken place with, uh, with the governmental authorities? With regard to statistics, in order to measure the extent of the situation and to put in place an adaptive policy, we need to have uh, statistics to hand does the criminal justice system have a database? Finally, with regard to reintegration, this is with regard to returning to normal life. This must be prepared for, but experiences in different countries are not all the same. What should the components of this reinsertion reintegration be? Can the child be prepared for the exit of their parent from prison? And has a 
uh, training being put in place for the child to be taken care of afterwards. What do you think about reintegration issues? Thank you. Thank you very much for the introductory start off uh, batch of questions for us to uh, to be thinking about during the course of the day. Um, may I uh, ask your indulgence to the participants of this group that uh, would it be acceptable if we did not have a, uh, a break in between because uh, we have until one o'clock and since we are running a little late, we will continue until one o'clock and then go for our lunch, uh, to our lunch break. Is that acceptable? I see nodding in the hair. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I do realize that some of our uh, participants have not been able to uh, give us a submission or it was late in the submission. Please, uh, if you can provide us with an electronic version, with the greening uh, initiative, we would try not to uh, make uh, uh, photocopies of the, all the submissions. We already have on our website a list of uh, very valuable submissions that have already been uh, submitted. But uh, for those of you who are just bringing your submission, we would kindly appreciate if you can give it to us in an electronic version so they will be posted on the website. Um, with this, I will. Uh, I, I think, uh, Julia, you have your your flag up to speak. Uh, for all the speakers, if you could uh, identify who you are, and uh, then we will proceed from there. Julia, you have the floor. Good you here. <coughs> uh, my name is Julia Sloth Nielsen. I'm a member of the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, which is the monitoring body for the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, the regional treaty which has now been ratified by 45 of the 53 member states of the African Union. Dr. Skelton has already alluded to the fact that our regional charter has a dedicated provision, Article 30, uh, binding states parties in relation to special treatment for expectant mothers 